It is my pleasure today to speak about one of the very important topics in clinical nephrology. Why? Because I'm speaking about diabetes and chronic kidney disease. And all of us know that diabetes is one of the leading causes of chronic kidney disease. And this month we have the 2020 kidney guidelines. So I'm going to highlight the kidney guidelines and other issues. So this is the outline of this presentation to start with the Kidigo guidelines, then the sodium glucose co-transporter two inhibitors, the most updated issues, starting with DABA CKD trial and beyond. The interaction of sodium glucose co-transporter two inhibitors and hypoxia in usable factors. The issue of euglycemic ketoacidosis. When to do kidney biopsy or the rule of renal biopsy in managing a diabetic patient? What are the risk factors for progression of chronic kidney disease in diabetic and non-diabetic patients? The AKI, acute occurrence of acute kidney injury in diabetes, hypoglycemia and arrhythmias in chronic kidney disease, and a few words about COVID and diabetes. So this is the outline of this presentation. I'm going to give the KD guidelines, the current KD guidelines, full details for the practice reflected points. So this is the issue of Kidney International. This is a supplement of October in 120 pages. And the executive summary is published in the current issue of Kidney International regular journal. So I'm going to focus on the most important practical points uh, from kidney guidelines for, man, for the management of uh, uh, kidney disease in diabetic patients. To start with, comprehensive care in patients with diabetes and CKD should be our goal. Patients with diabetes and CKD should be treated with a comprehensive strategy to reduce risks of kidney disease progression and the cardiovascular disease. It seems that treatment of diabetic uh, kidney disease or kidney disease in diabetes is to avoid the cardiovascular diseases and these uh, uh, important outcome. Uh, KDU guidelines recommend that treatment with angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin II receptor blocker be initiated in patients with diabetes, hypertension, and albuminuria, and that these medications be titrated to the highest approved dose that is tolerated. It is one of the most important points. Why? Because sometimes we neglect them where they are critically indicated for diabetes, and the presence of kidney disease or albuminuria specifically. And I'm going to explain the members and the doses for both classes in a minute. The guidelines recommend advising patients with diabetes and CKD who use tobacco to quit, to stop smoking. And I like this lifestyle modification is of para amount of importance. And this is a pyramid of care putting heart and kidney together. So kidney and heart risk factor management for all patients, diabetic and kidney disease patients. We should target all these domains, exercise, nutrition, stopping smoking, all these are lifestyle modification of para amount of importance. Glycemic control, blood pressure control, and the lipid uh, control all these are important for all patients. So for all patients, this uh, category should be covered well. For the most of the patients where we have hypertension with albuminuria, uh, the, then with uh, preserved GFR, we can think of sodium glucose co-transporter two inhibitors for treating diabetes and for rasperocade are essential drugs. And for patients, uh, some patients with uh, the aim of secondary prevention for well-established cardiovascular disease to give antiplatelet or even primary prevention in certain high-risk group of patients for cardiovascular disease 
and to weigh the balance between the risk and the benefit of using antiplatelet therapy. This is the pyramid of care. Uh, we should do checklists for all these points and to discuss them with the patient regarding lifestyle. Patients with diabetes and the CKD and the chronic kidney disease should consume an individualized diet high in vegetables, fruits, whole grains, fibers, legumes, plant-based proteins, unsaturated fats and nuts, and lower in processed meats, refined carbohydrate. We don't like refined carbohydrate and sweetened beverages. So this is the dietary uh, recommendation. Guidelines suggest maintaining a protein intake of 0.8 gram protein per kg uh, body weight per day for those with diabetes and the CKD not treated with dialysis. And this is a suggestion based on low evidence. And the guidelines suggest that sodium intake to be less than two gram of sodium, if we think of sodium, and if we speak about chlo sodium chloride, less than five gram sodium chloride, small spoon. So this is the recommendation, either two gram, less than two gram sodium, or less than five gram sodium chloride in patients with diabetes and the CKD suggestion based on low evidence. But this is what we recommend and what we advise for our patients. Uh, the guidelines recommend that patients with diabetes and CKD be advised to undertake moderate intensity physical activity for a cumulative duration of at least 150 minutes per week or to a level compatible with their cardiovascular and physical tolerance. Recommendation, but based on a very low level of evidence. So these are the lifestyle modification that we should educate the patients for uh, all of these. Regarding diet, I think it is very nice by the, if this is our plate of food, one half from fruits and vegetables, one quarter uh, from protein uh, or animal or plant, and the, the uh, fourth quarter, whole grains, starchy vegetables. So again, to increase the amount of fruits and vegetables, to put in mind. So this is the advice for our patients. For salt, we don't like excess salt. And we don't advise salt-free diet, but to cut down, to reduce salt in food. How to reduce? There are 10 ways to cut out salt. We can take them one by one. If we start from this uh, side, through buying fresh foods and the cook at home, because the already made food and fast foods are full of salt. Avoid foods with more than 400 milligram sodium per serving. Avoid salty processed meats. Use fresh meat, poultry, and uh, eggs or plant proteins instead. Keep healthy unsalted snacks on hand, uh, including fresh fruit. When eating out in restaurants, order sauces, dressings, and gravies in a separate dish and use very little amount, use less. Cut salty sauces like soy sauce, replace with pineapple juice or uh, other unseasoned uh, uh, rice vinegar. So this is how to change the, our habit. Use unsalted butter, unsalted margarine, cooking oil or other unsalted fat when possible. Use sweet sour, bitter, and spicy. So spicy foods can replace the flavor of salt. Red labels shows lower salt brands uh, when possible. Take uh, to put in consideration that breads are, uh, uh, are uh, rich in salt. For the bread to, be, to have its consistency, there should be salt. To be careful and to read the label on even on the bread. Use salt fresh spices, salt free spices, 
and fresh uh, herbs to add flavor. So these are 10 steps, 10 ways to cut out salt, to put in it in our mind. For physical activity, we evaluate the patient. Either the patient is sedentary, in this way, we should assess fall risk and comorbidity burden. If fall risk and comorbidity burden is within this low risk, so recommend low intensity activity and increase intensity as tolerated. If the patient is on high risk for fall or comorbidity burden, uh, refer the patient to exercise specialist. If the patient is active, but for, more, for less than 150 minutes per week, two and a half hours, recommended to increase physical activity level to achieve more than 150 minutes per week. Unable to increase activity level due to comorbid condition, continue current level. Achieves recommended physical activity level, go ahead and assess and recommend the muscle training activities for this group of patients and for the very the active persons uh, uh, with physical activity more than 150 minutes per week, starting muscle strengthening activities. So I think it is very simple advice. For angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blocker, please initiate them, giving them priority, especially if hypertension is associated with CKD and especially in proteinuric or albuminuric patients. So whenever you start, monitor serum creatinine and the potassium within two to four weeks. And I think this is a relaxation because in the past, we advise for monitoring after a week. So after two to four weeks, according to the flexibility, monitor both potassium and the creatinine. If we have normal kalemia, and there is no rise of creatinine or the maximum rise is less than 30% of the baseline creatinine, increase the dose of S inhibitor or ARB or continue on maximally tolerated doses. And when we increase the dose, we monitor the patient for potassium and creatinine again. So if we are here, we are, the drug is very nice and you continue. If we have problems, if we have hyperkalemia, we should review concurrent drugs, moderate potassium intake, consider diuretics, sodium bicarbonate, and cation exchange for reducing potassium to allow continuation of ACE inhibitor or ARBs. If hyperkalemia persists, we may think of reduction of the dose or stopping ACE inhibitor or ARB at the last resort. The same if we have high creatinine, about 30%, review other causes of acute kidney injury in the patient, correct the volume depletion if it's associated, reassess con uh, concomitant drugs like diuretics or non steroidal consider renal artery stenosis. And the last resort is to stop ACE inhibitor or ARBs. This means the, the current KDGO, October 2020, stresses on the value of using angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blocker. How to use them? I think this is a very uh, comprehensive table for the members of ACE inhibitors, arranged alphabetical. Uh, this is benzaprel, captopril, enalapril, fosinopril, lisinopril, uh, brindopril, uh, conopril, ramipril, and uh, terendolopril. So these are the different members of ACE inhibitors. So for benzaprel, started by 10 milligram, this is a starting dose. The maximum daily dose is 80 milligram. But in mind the kidney function, if creating clearance above 30, no dosage adjustment needed for benzaprel. But if it is less than 30, reduce initial dose to five milligram once daily for adults. Parent compounds are not removed by hemodialysis. So this is regarding the behavior of the drug in kidney impairment. For captobrel, the starting dose is 12.5 to 25 milligram, two to three times daily because it is short-acting drug, 
and the maximum use uh, 50 three times daily and may go up to the high dose, but we don't use this dose at all. Half-life is increased in patients with kidney impairment, creating clearance between 10 to 50, administer 75 of normal dose every 12 to 18 hours. If creating clearance less than 10, administer 50% of the normal dose every 24 hours. In hemodialysis, administer the drug after dialysis, about 40% of the drug is removed by hemodialysis. For enalapril, the starting is five milligram. The maximum is 50, 40 milligram, creating clearance less than 30. And adult patients reduce initial dose to 25 milligram uh, once daily, orally. Uh, 25 milligram uh, oral after hemodialysis on dialysis day. Dose on non-dialysis days should be adjusted based on clinical response. For fosinobrel, 10 milligram is the initiating dose and we can increase, escalate up to 80 gram, milligram. There is no dose adjustment necessary in kidney impairment and the poorly removed by hemodialysis. For lisinopril, 10 milligram is the starting dose. To reach 40 milligram, this is the maximal daily dose. In creating clearance from 10 to 30, reduce the initial dose by 50%, a maximum 40 milligram. In creating clearance less than 10, reduce initial dose to 2.5 milligram uh, once daily, and the maximum is 40 milligram. Brendoprel, two milligram is the initial dose, and we can reach the maximal dose, which is eight milligram. Use is not recommended when creating clearance is less than 30 milliliter per minute. For conoprel, starting is 10 milligram, the maximum is 80, and this is the how we change according to the kidney function. About 12% of the parent compound removed by hemodialysis. For ramibrel, 2.5 milligram once daily to be increased to the maximum 20 milligram. Administer 25% of normal dose when creating clearance is less than 40, minimally removed by hemodialysis. For terendolabrel, uh, start with one milligram and the maximum dose is four milligram. For creating clearance less than 30 milliliter per minute, reduce initial dose to 0.5 milligram per day. So I think it is a comprehensive table and it, I give it long time because it is very valuable how to use this mag magic class of drugs. The alternative is angiotensin receptor blocker. Again, these are the agents of angiotensin receptor blocker arranged alphabetically in this table. Uh, for uh, we don't have this, uh, uh, I don't have experience with this uh, drug, but the starting dose of uh, azelia sartan is 20 to 80 milligram once a daily. The maximum is 80 milligram. Dose adjustment is not required in patients with mild to severe kidney impairment or kidney failure. For canzartan, starting 16 milligram once a daily, we can reach a 32. In patients with creatine clearance, less than 30 milliliter per minute, area under curve and CMAX were approximate doubled with repeated uh, dosing, not removed by hemodialysis. For Erbizartan, 150 milligram once a daily, the maximum is 300. No dose adjustment necessary and not removed by hemodialysis in renal impairment. Luzartan, 50 milligram once a daily, the maximum is 100 milligram. No dose adjustment in the presence of renal dysfunction, not removed by hemodialysis. Olmizartan, 20 milligram, and the maximum is 40 milligram. And this is the caution in the presence of renal impairment and hasn't been studied in dialysis patient. Tilmizartan, 40 to 80. No dose adjustment necessary, not removed by hemodialysis. Valzartan, 80 milligram. The maximum dose is 320. No dose adjustment available for creating clearance less than 30 milliliter per minute to use with caution, not removed significantly by hemodialysis. Again, both S inhibitors and the ARBs are essential drugs uh, to be uh, respected, to be used efficiently, and uh, uh, we should learn how to use the available agent and to consider the modifications and the eligibility of uh, the different members. Let us go to the second important point in the guidelines. 
glycemic monitor, how to monitor glycemia. The guidelines recommend using A1C hemoglobin A1C to monitor glycemic control in patients with diabetes and CKD. And the target is to individualize our target. Suppose that we have patients in the early stages of CKD, just albuminuria, and GFR is perfect. In this scenario, we should target intensified glycemic control. Why? Trying to reduce the progression and retard the progression of chronic kidney disease. But if we have severe CKD, stage five, we should be relaxed and A1C to be less than 8%. Why? Because there is increased the risk of hypoglycemia and hypoglycemia may be fatal. So this is an individualization based on the degree of chronic kidney disease and the presence of other comorbidities. So if we have comorbidities, if they are many, we should be relaxed in our treatment. If life expectancy is short, we shouldn't follow intensive glycemic control. If there is risk of hypoglycemia, we should be careful about intensified glucose control. Putting in mind the limitations of A1C, because in CKD, there is a bias toward the high levels in the presence of metabolic acidosis, uh, toward the lower uh, than the actual, uh, because of the presence of transfusion or using ESA therapies, to put all these limitations in mind. But because A1C is monitored uh, every three months, I think it is uh, feasible for our patients with understanding these limitations. This is why A1C in stages uh, one, two, three B, and three B means the GFR is uh, uh, down to uh, 30. So it is uh, from normal to 30 milliliter per minute. Yes, major A1C twice per year, up to four times per year, if not achieving target or change in therapy, reliability on A1C is high. And this is the glucose measurement occasionally useful. For a stage four and five, including treatment by dialysis or kidney transplant, yes, major A1C twice per year, up to four times per year, if not achieving, if the patient is not achieving the target or we adopt some changes in treatment, the reliability of A1C in this scenario is low and it is better to monitor glycemic state. Regarding the drugs, anti-diabetic, anti-hyperglycemic drugs, glycemic management for patients with type 2 diabetes and CKD should include lifestyle therapy, first-line treatment with metformin and sodium glucose transporter 2 inhibitors. And I think this is a major change in the guidelines and additional drug therapy as needed for glycemic control. The guidelines are recommended treating patients with type 2 diabetes and it's made GFR above or equal 30 with metformin. The evidence of metformin is one, this level of recommendation. B, the evidence of research is moderate. Look at SGL2 inhibitors, 1A recommendation based on a strong level of evidence to put all this in mind. In patients with type 2 diabetes and the chronic kidney disease who haven't achieved the individualized glycemic targets despite use of metformin and sodium glucose cotransporter 2 inhibitors or who are unable to use those medications, the guidelines recommend a long-acting glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist recommendation based on moderate evidence. So I think this is a major change in recommendation for using antihyperglycemic drugs in coronary kidney disease. So if we take it in this figure, we we'll start with lifestyle modification, nutrition with loss, and then metformin plus sodium glucose cotransporter to inhibitor as first line of drugs as antihyperglycemic. Be careful, metformin to be discontinued if SMH GFR is less than 30, and to be discontinued in dialysis. SGL2 inhibitor don't initiate if SMH GFR is less than 30 and discontinue in dialysis. And then to think of GLEB1 receptor agonist the first, uh, in the first order to be added and to be followed by other classes according to certain indications. And I think all the strategy of individualization of drugs to be added uh, after the 
the metformin and sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitors are explained very well here in this figure. So if the patient doesn't like injection, then we don't like injection, GLP-1 receptor agonist and insulin, and then the preference will be the oral medication. If we need weight loss, so the added drug after metformin and the CGL2 inhibitor is GLP-1 receptor agonist because it is, this class is potent for weight reduction. We don't like sulfonylurea and insulin and TZBs because they may be associated with weight gain. If there is uh, the, uh, for example, if we need potent gl uh, glucose lowering, GLP-1 receptor agonist and insulin are the preferred DB4 inhibitors and others may be here less uh, of the choice. If the patient is, has heart failure or high risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, the first choice is GLP-1 receptor agonist. Here, if there is heart failure, we don't like TZDs because of volume uh, overload. So to be careful about all uh, these uh, points and for individualization. If this image GFR is less than 15, then who can use DB4 inhibitor insulin or TZDs? Sulfonylurea or uh, the uh, alpha glucosidose inhibitor cannot be used in this very low estimated GFR or patients on dialysis. So according to the patient criteria, we should individualize and tailor the added treatment to metformin and the sodium glucose co-transporter two inhibitors for metformin. And we should ask ourselves, is estimated GFR less than 30? Stop metformin. Don't initiate metformin. This according to the current KD guidelines. If GFR is above 30, uh, then if it is above 60, so we can use immediate release, initiating 500, 500 milligram or 850 once a daily, titrate upward by 500 daily or uh, 80, uh, 850 milligram daily every seven days until the maximum dose. Or to start with extended release metformin, if gas on side effects from immediate release, initial 500 milligram daily, titrate upwards by 500 milligram per day every seven days until maximum dose. This is for patients with GFR above 45, so either above 60 or above 45. For patients with estimated GFR between 30 to less than 45, initiate at half the dose and titrate upwards to half of the maximum recommended dose. Monitor vitamin B12 annually if on metformin for more than four years or at risk of vitamin B12 deficiency. Monitor kidney function annually in this group of patients for the SMG for above 60, if it is between 45 to 60 uh, every three to six months. Uh, and this is uh, how we go. Suspic uh, subsequent dose adjustment to continue same if GFR is, is stable. If GFR is uh, uh, stable, we continue. Consider dose reduction if the GFR is between 45 to 60, but between 30 to 45, half the dose. So we should be dynamic, following algorithm uh, as uh, clarified in this slide. After metformin and the sodium glucose co-transporter two inhibitors, uh, the advice is to use glucagon-like peptide one receptor agonist. So this is the advice. And this is the recommendation based on a sufficient evidence uh, and to select the best for the cardiovascular benefit and to minimize, to minimize, to minimize gastrointestinal side effects and start with a low dose of GLEB1 receptor agonist and titrate up slowly to start uh, low and go slow. And this is the dose and the CKD adjustment for each member. We have dolaglutide that can be given sub-Q once weekly in this dose range. No dose adjustment used with estimated GFR above 15 milliliter per minute. This for exanatide, for other liraglutide, no dose adjustment, limited data for severe CKD. And this is the dose style. Semaglutide, we have injection in the oral form, and this is the dose, and this is no dose adjustment and the limited data for severe CKD. So this is, I think this is, uh, this is a good class too. Is there a difference between GLEB1 receptor agonists and DB4 inhibitors? 
This is a cohort of patients, including a large number in different countries. As you see, a huge number for DBB4 inhibitors and for GLP1 receptor agonists. And the, as you see, cumulative incidence of serious renal events were significantly lower in the group of GLP1 receptor agonists, irrespective to the demographics and sub-categorization of the patients. So this is the renal advantage of DBB4 inhibitors. So let us go to an interesting algorithm. If we want to individualize our treatment, how to individualize? We assess the patients. If the patient is diabetic, have kidney and having kidney disease, we assess albuminuria and GFR. If albuminuria is high, above 300 milligram per gram, and it's mid GFR above 30, the first choice is is sodium glucose quadrant to inhibitor. But if it's mid GFR is less than 30, GLEB1 receptor agonist. And then assessing the risk for hospitalization with heart failure, if it is there, sodium glucose quadrant is the best. So this is how we individualize our management. If the patient's coronary, have a coronary uh, having, uh, having coronary heart disease, GLEB1 receptor agonist may be of the choice. So this is the the trend is to enhance uh, our capabilities for team-based integrated care delivered by physicians, non-physician personnel supported by decision makers. And, and this is how the process is going from registering, risk assessment, empowering the patient, risk stratification, coordinated care, reviewing risk factors, and uh, uncoordinated care uh, rel relay reinforce and recall, all these are factors and the goal is to to multiple targets, glycemia, blood pressure, lipids, use organ protective drugs, RAS inhibitor, SGL2 inhibitor, GLEB1 receptor agonostatins, and go support to promote self-care. Uh, very interesting. So let us go uh, directly to sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitor. What we, uh, do we have from the current lit literature? And this month, we have the release of the dabagliflozin. It was published, the trial was published online last September, but the, in, the, in the current issue of New England Journal of Medicine, dabagliflozin in patients with chronic kidney disease. It is very interesting study. And this just to show you, these are the trials of SGL2 inhibitors, putting cardiovascular as primary outcome. And you can find here the category of patients, either from GFR and albuminuria from the kidney point of view. And these are the two trials that are published. Credence was published last year in June in New England. And this month, the uh, DABA CKD this week is published in New England the Journal of Medicine. And this is the categorization of the patients you, you see here, the majority of patients have lower GFR less than 60 milliliter per minute, and the majority of patients have high degree of urine albumin creatinine ratio. Uh, I'm going to highlight the, CKD, the DABA CKD trial because it is the most recent published. It's double blind placebo randomized control trial. So we have DABA arm and we have placebo, and DABA was given 10 milligram once daily compared to placebo. Each arm uh, includes more than 2,000 patients. And this is the age and gender. I'm not careful about this. But what is more interesting for me, not all patients are diabetic. Two-thirds only were diabetic. And one-third uh, are uh, CKD without diabetes. This is the range of estimated GFR. The majority of patients are in this category, uh, between 30 to 45 milliliters per minute. 45% here, 42% here, even less than 30 milliliter per minute, 13% in DABA arm and 15% in placebo arm. And for albuminuria, above the, the this is the, uh, the median uh, range of albuminuria uh, in both arms and in uh, if, if it is above uh, this value uh, in here in 50% almost. Again, the two thirds of patients were diabetic and one third non diabetic. Uh, here, this is the percentage of patients with heart failure, 10% in each arm. And this is a concomitant medication. So, DABA gloflozin was added uh, on top of its inhibitor or ARBs. And, it's, and this is the percentage of statin, two thirds of patients, 40% uh, of patients treated with diuretics, 
and this is the majority of patients are treated with either ACE inhibitors or angiotensin A2 blocker. What are the main results that we have? Primary outcome, which is renal, the event occurs here, events per 100 patients per year, 4.6 in dabagliflozin, 7.5 in placebo with significant B value less than 0.001. This is significant reduction of the hazard issue a primary composite outcome uh, for declining estimated GFR more than 50%, occurrence of any stage kidney disease, long-term dialysis, the need of transplantation, death from renal cause, death from cardiovascular cause. Secondary outcome, including all these points. So again, uh, this study showed positive effect on the kidney from primary outcome and the secondary outcome. And the study was uh, uh, terminated because of the beneficial effect as you see in these curves for the uh, dabagliflozin was associated with lower hazard ratio, 0.6 primary composite uh, point. And for renal specific composite outcome, here it is significantly reduced in dabagliflozin. Again, uh, for all parameters studied, hospitalization for heart failure, and this is, I think this is a good signal for heart failure from DABA kidney, and we have DABA heart failure that I discussed in one of my videos before. So this is the, and death from any cause significantly lower in the DABA gliflozin arm. Safety profile is there. There was no major side effects in comparison to placebo, maybe with the exception of uh, increased uh, volume depletion, but all other side effects, the drug was tolerated and no problems. Does the result, does this result link it to uh, certain demographic criteria irrespective to the demographics the patient has, uh, gender, age, uh, race, uh, geographic area, type, the presence or absence of diabetes. And this is a very important point. In diabetic or non-diabetic, giving a dabagliflozin was associated with significant reduction of the outcome of the hazards, and this is the uh, this is a bonus point. And with the CMIG for less than 45 or above 45, urine albuminuria less than 1,000, above 1,000, systolic blood pressure is low or high. So again, uh, the uh, dabagliflozin was effective and a uh, real addition for the treatment. One of the very practical tip, whenever we use sodium glucose transporter to inhibitors, and I think it is with impagliflozin as well and others, here the, in the starting points, because of hemodynamic effect, you can find sharp reduction of the GFR and then stabilization plateau. And then at the end of the follow-up, you can find even preservation of kidney function. So to, uh, to put it in mind, this is the post hoc analysis for uh, DIBIC randomized control trial uh, for type 1 diabetes using dabagliflozin for patients with albuminuria with subsequent reduction of albuminuria, 13% if DABA is given in 5 milligram per day and 30% if DABA is given 10 milligram per day. And for embagliflozin, embagliflozin is efficient as is shown here in this uh, recent study. Uh, the observed effects of IMBA versus placebo on cardiovascular and kidney outcomes were consistent across the kidney risk categories. So the, it seemed uh, cardiovascular outcome, kidney outcome uh, here for kidney outcomes in IMBA, it's 1.7% in the placebo 3, 1.1%. So IMBA gliflozin is effective. For heart failure, this is one of my videos. I discussed the emperor reduced and DABA heart failure trials. Today, I'm not going to discuss them, but I'd like to highlight the most recent published uh, trial uh, on ertogliflozin. Uh, this is for 8,246 patients. Uh, and this, uh, this study was published online on 7th, 7th of October. Uh, double blind placebo controlled trial, a strong design. Er uh, ertogliflozin was given either five or 15 milligram, and we have uh, other arm, which is placebo. And this is the hospitalization of the heart failure or occurrence of cardiovascular disease in comparison to uh, 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 the placebo. 
sodium glucose could transport it inhibitor ertiglufloxacin was associated with significant reduction of both outcomes, which is exciting for me is the renal, uh, not heart failure. Uh, heart failure is essential, but here I like it. In patients with lower GFR, less than 60 here, the rate is uh, significantly is reduced in uh, the, uh, in the uh, uh, ER2 group. In albuminuria, in the presence of micro and the macro, A2 or A3, this is what we be referred nowadays, the drug is beneficial. And for uh, even the use of uh, loop diuretics, the drug is still effective. So it seemed that this drug is associated with uh, uh, primary cardiovascular uh, endpoint and some secondary endpoint for the kidney. This is a nice review about the use of sodium pharmacological agents uh, targeting cardiovascular disease. These are the members of sodium glucose cotransporter inhibitors and the members of GLAB1 receptor agonists. And this is the concept. If heart failure or chronic kidney disease are there, preferring sodium glucose cotransporter to inhibitor. If A1C already on target, we can substitute other drugs to SGL2 inhibitors or GLAB1 receptor agonists, putting in consideration the availability and the cost. And this is the meta analysis association of SGL2 inhibitors with cardiovascular and kidney outcomes in patients with type 2 diabetes. It reviewed all the studies. This is Embareg, Canvas, Declare Timmy, Credence, and the Vertis CV trial. And this is six trials, including 46,000 patients, and I think before DABA CKD trial. The question is if the effectiveness of sodium glucose co transporter 2 inhibitors on cardiovascular and the kidney related outcomes similar across the class of medications overall and by the presence or absence of prevalent cardiovascular and chronic kidney disease, this is a question. If we go to the results, if we, if we look at the overall cardiovascular de death, you can find heterogeneity, as you see here, between different members, but at the end of the day, overall, there is a beneficial effect. Uh, but if, uh, and with categorization of cardiovascular death by atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, you will find heterogeneity as well. But for overall hospitalization due to heart failure, there is consistency between different members. And for the kidney, this is the kidney outcome. Here, the majority of drugs are uh, excellent. So the, this is the conclusion. The findings of this meta-analysis suggest that SGL2 inhibitors have some heterogeneity of association with outcomes of cardiovascular death, but consistent of favorable hospitalization for heart failure and the kidney disease outcomes across the classes, across the class, across different members in the class. So this is an interesting and important point to declare. This is a consensus statement, and this again before DABA uh, CKD. In this consensus, the authors qualitatively synthesized the evidence demonstrating the renal effects of SGL2 inhibitors and have proposed recommendations for optimal use of SGL2 inhibitors effectively manage and delay progression of diabetic kidney disease. And this is a summary of recommendation. SGL2 inhibitors can be used as add-on second line therapy and as you see in the in the kidigo the it is now primary with metformin initial reduction in estimated gfr is expected after initiation of sgl2 inhibitors and hence we should monitor the patients if patient with estimated gfr less than 60 should be closely monitored as their local practice for renal function parameters if it is above 45 uh, this SGL2 can be used. SGL2 inhibitors can be continued if estimated GFR between 30 to 45 milliliter per minute. If SGL2 inhibitor, SGL2 inhibitor should be discontinued if estimated GFR fall below 30 and shouldn't be used in patients with end stage or dialysis. Patient selection and education should be an integral part of the management when initiating SGL2 inhibitors. Why? Because caution should be taken when prescribing this class of drugs to patients with a history of prior amputation, severe peripheral vascular disease, 
neuropathy, foot ulcers, hypersensitivity reaction, eoglycemic ket diabetic ketoacidosis, and those on diuretic therapy. Patients should be educated on perineal and the genital hygiene and the signs and the symptoms of mycotic uh, infections. Early diagnosis and treatment should be encouraged. Regarding the hypoxia and disorder factor, we have two types. Hypoxia and disorder factor one alpha and the two alpha. Uh, uh, they have some concordant and this concordant effect. So for example, hypoxia and disorder factor two alpha is associated with inflammation, fibrosis, and increased uh, erythropoietin production. And hypoxia, uh, uh, one alpha is associated with increased inflammation. So this reduces inflammation and this increases inflammation, increases angiogenesis. And so this is the, the panoramic view of both hypoxia and disorder factor one alpha and hypoxia and disorder factor two alpha. What occurs in type two diabetes is increase of hypoxia and disorder factor one alpha, which is bad. And the reduction of hypoxia and disorder factor Two alpha, which would we, we uh, uh, want them. So the bad is elevated and the beneficial is reduced with subsequent inflammation and the, the reducing erythropoiesis. So if you use sodium glucose transport to inhibitors or a cobalt chloride, both of them can reduce this abnormality. So uh, uh, reduces hypoxia and disorder factor one alpha and increases hypoxia and disorder factor two alpha increasing erythropoiesis, reducing inflammation and fibrosis. Again, eoglycemic ketoacidosis, diabetic ketoacidosis. I, uh, I'm stressing on this uh, side effect, although you may find uh, side effect as rare as mentioned by endocrinology and diabetologists. Uh, but these are the types of patients at high risk of uh, eoglycemic DKA with sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitors. Patients with a low reserve of insulin secreting cell. Patient at restricted food intake. Patient at, ris at risk of hypovolemia. Patients with a sudden reduction in insulin dose. Patient at increased requirement for insulin due to illness, surgery, or alcohol abuse. Patients with type 1 diabetes receiving the drug off-label. Patient with hidden diagnosis of latent autoimmune diabetes of adulthood or positive GAD antibodies. So all these are patients with increasing risk of development of glycemic DKA after sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitor. How to prevent withdraw SGL inhibitor in patients scheduled to undergo major surgical procedure at least three days before surgery and don't resume sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitor except after ensuring the uh, resuming the basal state in eating and everything. Uh, withdraw sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitor in patient hospitalized due to severe illness, like COVID. We don't like them in hospitalized COVID patients. Use insulin instead of SGLT2 inhibitors in presence of other predisposing risk factors for DKA. Why euglycemic DKA occur with sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitor? Because this class of drugs reduces insulin and increases glucagon with subsequent increased lipolysis. Unfortunately, urinary acetone is not perfect because these drugs increase the absorption, reabsorption of ketone bodies. So if we want to measure ketone bodies, it's better to monitor them in blood, not in urine. And this is how to treat stopping sodium glucose co-transfer to inhibitor, giving fluids, giving insulin, and giving other treatment. Is it because of glucagon? Does glucagon a friend or foe? I think this is one of the very recent commentary uh, that explain some beneficial and harmful effect of glu increased glucagon in this class of drugs. One uh, of very important practical issue, to do biopsy or not to do biopsy in a diabetic patient. Uh, this is a very nice report, including 255 uh, uh, diabetic uh, uh, non-insulin type 2 diabetes, 93 patients had diabetic nephropathy alone based on the biopsy, 69 non-diabetic renal disease, and the remaining had mixed uh, diabetic nephropathy plus non-diabetic. Non -diabetic. So this is a large cohort of patients. And if you look at the second and third group who were uh, here 
either we have non-diabetic kidney disease or a mix etiology, you can find a cocktail of any etiology, IgA, membranous, focal segmental, minimal change, uh, malignant nephrosclerosis, vasculitis, intrusion nephritis, osmotic nephritis, ATC. So uh, this is why we shouldn't deprive, we should not deprive diabetic patient from biopsy. And the threshold for biopsy, I think, should be reduced. Uh, because in this stage, this is even for prognostic value, if the biopsy is diabetic nephropathy alone, uh, we can expect a high risk of indecision kidney disease in comparison to non-diabetic patients. In this cohort of patients, mixed group also uh, has a poorer outcome. But in other groups, both non-diabetic and the mixed group uh, enjoyed better prognosis than diabetes, diabetic nephropathy alone. This is a question. Has the time come for us to offer an renal biopsy to all type 2 diabetes patients and consider them as any CKD or GN that should dose with urinary protein above gram be biopsied? This is a question. And I think we don't agree about this issue from safety and from cost effectiveness of doing biopsy. So the majority of nephrologists would consider renal biopsy in a typical history, short history of type 2 diabetes, absence of retinopathy, presence of microscopic hematuria, rapid progressive renal failure, evidence of vasculitis or systemic disease, and uh, this is, uh, but they wouldn't perform a routine renal biopsy as in the case of a CKD patient, unless it is of research indication. For progression of CKD, uh, this, uh, I'm going to highlight one of the very recent uh, uh, cohort of patient, CREC, chronic renal insufficiency cohort, this, this includes, this cohort includes diabetic and non-diabetic. And as you see from the first beginning, the, this slide shows that with the different degrees of CKD, we can expect the rate of progression. So with, with reduction of estimate GFR, the risk of progression is increased. And the rate of increase of the progression is more significant, is highly significant in diabetic patients in comparison to non-diabetic. Both of them progresses with low GFR, especially diabetic patients. And there are many uh, parameters, clinical laboratory parameters uh, addressed in this cohort of patients. And this is the, uh, this is the urinary chemokines, uh, probe in B cardiac, urinary inigal uh, are associated with progression of diabetic patients, especially. Uh, this is the uh, overall results of uh, this cohort that a strong association of chemokine 12, urinary in the gal and the cardiac marker uh, probin B uh, here for diabetic patients and this is for non-diabetic patients. Look at these and I think I like this style to know progression and to predict the progression from the criteria clinical, laboratory and other parameters. And this, uh, this cohort was followed up for uh, 12 years uh, and 47% of the patients in this cohort were diabetic. AKI, it seems that diabetes is associated with higher risk of AKI, either with the presence or absence of CKD. So this is why we should be careful about the AKI, occurrence of AKI in diabetic patients. Hypoglycemia, with the advancement of CKD, we can expect increased prevalence of hypoglycemia. So this is 76% developed hypoglycemia was continuous glucose monitoring less than 70 milligram per deciliter. Here 61% uh, glycemia less than 60 milligram, 39% uh, developed prolonged hypoglycemia. Uh, so to put all this in mind, this is why in advanced stages of CKD, our goal, it changes from aggressive and intensified glycemic control toward relaxed approach to avoid hypoglycemia because hypoglycemia may be associated with arrhythmia as shown from this continuous glucose monitoring and the mobile cardiac telemetry to where the arrhythmias was preceded by drop of glycemia even if it is still within normal range. And this is the uh, atrial fibrillation. It seemed that CKD is associated with atrial fibrillation uh, to be put in mind. And this is the, this is the very nice uh, brief report about the value 
of sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitors and its association with atrial fibrillation. Does, it, does this group uh, beneficial for reducing atrial fibrillation? Let us go and look. Yes, the group was associated with reduction of the incidence of atrial fibrillation in the cardiovascular and renal outcome trials. Fantastic. The, the most important question, why? Why the use of sodium glucose cotransferrin 2 inhibitors is associated with the reduction of the incidence of atrial fibrillation? There are many speculations uh, that uh, is demonstrated, uh, the different factors are demonstrated in this slide. Uh, through reduction of weight loss because obesity is associated with increased atrial fibrillation. Reduction in blood pressure because hypertension may increase the risk of atrial fibrillation. The uh, heart failure is a cause of atrial fibrillation and this drug promotes natriuresis, promotes diuresis, inhibits sodium, proton antiporter, reduce heart failure hospitalization. Hypomagnesemia is ameliorated and the hyperuricemia is ameliorated and both of them are linked to atrial fibrillation. Sodium glucose co-transporter result increased the magnesium and reduced uric acid. Increasing magne magnesium, it seems that it is linked to glucagon effect. Mitochondrial dysfunction uh, is associated with atrial fibrillation and SGL2 inhibitors resulted in possible promotion of mitochondrial biogenesis. Left atrial dilatation is reduced by the using of this class. Epicardial fat, uh, the sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitor may result in reduction in epicardial fat SG2 result increase insulin sensitivity and improved glycemic control. So it seems that sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitor through amelioration of the different risk factors for atrial fibrillation, they reduce the incidence of atrial fibrillation. Regarding COVID, COVID can lead to diabetes and diabetes can increase the risk of uh, uh, the problems and severity of COVID. So both of them are bad alliance and they uh, chair in this conspiracy, this uh, the problems. Both of them are associated with inflammation. In diabetes, it is low grade inflammation, but in COVID it is high grade and acute. The most important message I would like to stress upon, we should individualize our treatment and the diabetic drugs, even insulin may be uh, risky for hypoglycemia. So we should monitor glycemic state and for severe and critical illness, the insulin in the line, the line of treatment, SGL2 inhibitor may not be uh, a drug of choice, especially if the feeding and oral intake and other dehydration and others are there. The same for GLP-1 receptor agonist because of the risk of gastrointestinal side effects. Sulfonaria may lead to hypoglycemia, so we should be careful for all drugs. It seems that DB4 inhibitor may be of value uh, because they even antagonize the virus through interference with db 4 uh, Metformin, even if it has antiviral effect, but because of the gastrointestinal side effect and the risk of lactic acidosis, we don't like uh, this drug. So in COVID patients, we should individualize our treatment. I would like to end this presentation by the current TQT guidelines shed the light on important management and confirm the best treatment. And I think both in sodium glucose co-transporter, two inhibitors, followed by global receptor agonists in the, in the priority with metformin. This is, I think this is a real addition. Take care of lifestyle modification. Uh, learn how to optimize the follow-up of the patients. And it is the, the day of individualized treat, treatment for diabetic patients. So time for clinical decision support, system tailoring individual patient therapy to improve renal and cardiovascular outcomes in diabetes and nephropathy. I would like to stop here. And please, if you have any question, don't hesitate to write on the YouTube video after its release and hope to be immediately. Thank you and goodbye.